So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Anna Cruz, who's going to speak about Paulo Freire's political pedagogical approach to education, um, questioning inequalities through dialogue, which follows very, very neatly, I think, from what we've been focusing on. Dr. Cruz is Professor of Education at St. Louis Community College at Merrimack um, St. Louis, USA. Her research interests include critical pedagogy, social justice, cultural studies, multicultural international education, and music and deafness. She's a former chair of the American Educational Research Association's Paulo Freire um, Special Interest Groups, amongst other research and publications and responsibilities. In 2021, she chaired the third international conference, Paulo Freire, The Global Legacy. So um, over to you, very much looking forward to hearing from you, Dr. Cruz, and we'll follow the same format for question and discussion afterwards through the chat, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mayer, for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this important event. And a special thank you to Dr. Joe Forster for inviting me uh, to participate in the research circle, Dialogues for Democracy, Culture and Ecologies in Crisis of the Centenary Commission on Adult Education. Uh, the title of my presentation today, Paulo Freire's Political Pedagogical Approach to Education, Questioning Inequality Through Dialogue, uh, it's in response to the invitation of jo Dr. Forster, who asked me to uh, think and present ways in which Freire's pedagogy and dialogical methods can provide a space to question social and economical conditions and uh, of structural inequities. So uh, I want to basically provide you with uh, the ideas of uh, Paulo Freire. Uh, and as I was preparing for this particular presentation today, uh, I had a chance to glance at uh, some of the, um, uh, some of the language of the 1919 uh, report, uh, uh, basically the final report of adult education uh, committee. And I also had a chance to glance at the a permanent national necessity, uh, the Centenary Commission in uh, Adult Education report. And it was with a very um, pleasant surprise that I, came across uh, so many terms, um, liberation, uh, social justice, and uh, the idea of uh, creating a more responsive uh, citizenry. Uh, uh, the language of that report is it's so in tune with the ideas of Paulo Freire, and that I, uh, that I actually could say, is Paulo Freire your theoretical model? Uh, that actually was uh, a question. I said, it looks like they are using Paulo Freire as a theoretical model uh, of the whole investigation and uh, uh, the idea behind uh, the analytical uh, uh, situation of education in, uh, in Great Britain. So um, for those not very familiar with Paulo Freire, Paulo Freire is a Brazilian educator, and uh, so am I. I'm actually Brazilian. I live in the U.S. for about half of my life now. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm Brazilian. So Paulo Freire uh, was born in Recife in 1921, and uh, he basically died in 1997 in Sao Paulo. So last year we celebrated uh, his uh, 100th birthday. And uh, we had a conference, as you basically mentioned, uh, was organizing a conference in celebration of his centennial. Uh, Paulo Freire, by train, was a lawyer, uh, but basically he uh, did not exercise law. He was an educator, he was a professor, he was a community organizer. And uh, a very significant event that basically changed his life dramatically was the 1964 coup d'etat and that uh, led him to exile was to Bolivia, Chile, USA, and most of the, uh, his exile, he lived in Switzerland, where he worked for the World Council of Churches in Geneva. 
And he returned to Brazil in 1980. And he became a professor in Brazil, Secretary of Education in the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, he is considered the, uh, one of the most eminent educator and educational philosophers of the 20th century. Uh, he is well known for his Pedagogy of the Oppressed, published in 1970. And he's the third most cited, uh, excuse me, he, uh, this publication is the third most cited book in the social sciences. So when you basically think about Paulo Freire, we need to think also about what you call a Freirean critical pedagogy, right? So uh, it's a little bit difficult to come up with a single definition. Some uh, educators even say that you have various critical pedagogies, uh, but I really like the approach that uh, Lessner and uh, Woodrum basically bring to us that afraid in critical pedagogy challenges us to recognize, to engage and critique so as to transform any existing undemocratic social practices and institutional structures that produce and sustain inequalities and oppressive social identities and relations. So it really, I think, uh, 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 talks about what my colleagues uh, basically have spoke about uh, the idea of uh, um, how to change, how to deal with inequalities and, 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 and where do we start? How do we do it? And uh, so uh, there is another way that uh, people also approach critical pedagogy that is based on Kinchelow and Dardé. They say that critical pedagogy is grounded on a social and educational vision of justice and equality constructed on the belief that education is inherently political and dedicated to alleviation of human suffering, attempts to link the practice of schooling to democratic principles of society and to transformative social action. So it's not just about understanding injustice, not just about going to school, but it is uh, the practice that brings uh, awareness, consciousness, um, uh, in order for us to transform what's not working. Uh, so the idea also of a Freudian free, free critical pedagogy, according to Donaldo Macedo, uh, he says critical pedagogy is a state of becoming. And I would add, is a constant state of becoming. A way of being in the world and with the world a never ending process that involves struggle and pain, but also hope and joy, shaped and maintained by a humanizing pedagogy. There has to be an exchange of uh, humanity. There has to be uh, hope. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the concepts of critical pedagogy. In the transformation, we need to have some type of joy guided by hope. And it is after all a human transformation. Um, now, when you think about Freire's approach to education, as I mentioned before, Freire really believes that education is inherently political. So there is no education um, without making choices. Every choice you make is a political action. So uh, many, uh, as I educated pre-service teachers, uh, I, sometimes I am confronted by statements as like, well, Dr. Cruz, don't talk about politics. I am not a political, I'm not a political person. I, I don't like politics. And uh, uh, we basically start discussing that in more detail and say, well, um, do you make choices in life? Of course I do, Dr. Cruz. I mean, how do you make choices? And they, they look at me and said, what exactly are you asking? That every choice is a political decision. You are representing a value. You are representing a belief. Every, every choice is political. And then they look a little bit skeptical in the beginning. But as we go along this semester, we start basically debating more and more uh, how choices are made. Uh, uh, in relation to the curriculum, in relation to the readings, in relation to 
everything that school input together and in order to what many times you wanted to say provide education right so but Frey really says that um, an approach to education should be a dialogical relationship between the learner and the teacher and that the, the dialogical relationship should be rooted in real life experiences of the learners and knowledge that they gain from it. So most of the times you feel uh, resistance and uh, discontent uh, from learners because they don't basically experience schooling uh, in a respectful way. Uh, their real life experiences most of the times are disregarded as uh, uh, something that you do outside of school that is unimportant, that is disconnected for the classical knowledge that you need to put together to become a powerful person, a respectful person in society. So in other words, who they are, particularly if they come from more humble backgrounds, is basically taught to them that it's not important. Um, yeah, a way that I describe in one of my recent papers I, I have been working on that I just sent for publication, a uh, colonization of the mind. So the school many times use uh, its status quo to disregard real life experiences in order to colonize the learner's mind to perpetuate a status quo. So Freire though, he wants an education that puts together the reading, the word, and the world. So it should be together. The life experiences of the students should come in contact with the content, with the education that we provide in the school setting. So education for Freire is, after all, a creative act. It's stimulating curiosity, and it's also the act of asking questions. So I was looking to uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee's approach to the arts and what a more stimulating uh, way of being educating than if not through the arts and uh, to revolutionize uh, through the arts. So I really believe a lot uh, in the power of art to basically uh, build that creative act of asking questions, of being curious. Um, Freire also says that education should not be depositing or transfusion of knowledge into passive learners. And that's what he called the banking concept, you know, sort of like you go to the bank, you deposit your coin. That should not be the type of education uh, that we should engage with if you, you want to basically have transformation and democracy. So, Education then should not be a vehicle for domestication, but a means for liberation, transformation of reality. So when you say that, I, uh, I basically have here um, a freight in critical pedagogy concepts. And I will be uh, discussing those uh, concepts uh, a little bit more in detail. I want to just you to see that based on my title, I will uh, emphasize dialogue, questioning, and conscientization. Uh, this is the, 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 the Portuguese word, uh, particular word uh, for um, uh, con conscientization. And I will talk a little bit more about that. So when you think about a trade in critical pedagogy, of course, dialogue, curiosity, hope, ethics, praxis agency, questioning, love, and again, conscientization. So what do you mean by hope? What is a critical uh, a pedagogy, a Freudian pedagogy uh, that uh, talks about hope? Why hope? Uh, because hope, uh, according to Freire, is what drives us to transformation. Now, let me just say something about hope in here. I, I have a dear colleague of mine who uh, we have uh, long debates about that whole concept of hope 
in a passive approach to it because he says, you know, Anna, I don't have hope. And he is someone very active in, uh, in society and said, oh, you do such a beautiful work socially. And you say you don't have hope. How can that be? I said, no, I, I was raised um, by sometimes listen to priests basically say, you don't have food today, little son. Uh, have hope, food will come for you tomorrow. And uh, many times I was starving, I was hungry, and you know, hope didn't feed my, my belly. And uh, we go back and forth and you say, no, 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 no. That is not the hope that Paulo Freire talks about. Actually, in Portuguese, we have a, a Paulo Freire put together sort of like a new word. In Portuguese, the word hope uh, is esperança. That is the equivalent, the word esperança, uh, meaning hope. But Freire does not talk just about esperança. He talks about esperançar. So he puts an action at the end of the adjective, esperançar, which means hope action, right? So hope should not prevail and be sustained by itself. But hope, in order to be transformative, needs to be an action. So that is esperançar. So Freire basically says that uh, though I know that things can get worse, I also know that I'm able to intervene to improve them. So that is the hope. That is the esperança. That is the hope action. I can change. I can improve things. He, he doesn't believe in fatalism. So um, also the concept of praxis agency, since you talk about action, praxis is the continued dialectical relationship of action and reflection. So an education should provide the learners with plenty of reflective opportunities, not just to understand the surrounding environment, but very important to understand the self. We can only be uh, effective agents in the surrounding environment if you are an effective, uh, on this, uh, 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 you have an effective understanding of yourself. Uh, when I have five minutes, if somebody can give me a hint to have five minutes, that would be great, okay? So uh, also if the praxis and agency concept, the action must be followed by reflection, which in turn, again, might lead to further action. So it's a continuum. Never stop. Um, now you come to love, right? So love is at the heart of freeing the oppressed. Remember the, the, the work that uh, uh, Freire became a uh, worldwide known, the pedagogy of the oppressed, uh, where he uh, basically says that uh, if you are not careful in educating the oppressed to free themselves in a conscious way, way, the oppressed can easily become the oppressor himself. So many times you see that uh, uh, that could be a big issue if you're thinking about changing, overcome inequities and inequalities. So Paulo Freire refers to armed love, which actually was proposed by Tiago de Mello. Uh, that term armed love uh, comes from Tiago de Mello, poet uh, from the Amazon area, which I actually from in Brazil. And he says that the armed love is the fighting love of those convinced of the right and the duty to fight, to denounce and to announce. It is not enough to only denounce what is not working. It is important to announce possibilities, ways in where we can make change. Um, the concept of questioning and curiosity. Curiosity always driving the act of asking questions. And this is one of the, unfortunately, one of the biggest crimes that uh, we see happening in schools is when educators uh, curtail uh, the opportunities for the learners to be curious, because if they are not curious, of course, they will not be able to be asking questions. So uh, 
questioning and curiosity are both instrumental in the generation of knowledge and both are related to the ability to think critically. We need more individuals from all the social stratification, all social classes to be able to think critically. To think critically seems to be uh, nowadays a privilege of those who have money and can afford uh, uh, private entrepreneurs and education opportunities. So critical thinking should be the right of all citizens in society. You should be educated to, say, to think critically. Um, and then comes the con concept of dialogue which denotes the whole exercise of speaking with and not the speaking to. That is where we concentrate on problem posing and uh, looking at teacher in a way uh, to respect, to have respect between individuals. It's just by having a dialogical relationship that the learner and the teacher can exercise that respectful exchange where, in which many times the learner becomes the teacher and the teacher becomes the learner. Because it's only when I know more, when I learn more about the learner, I can teach better. It's only by understanding the learner and let the learner teach me about him, herself, that I'm able to improve my teaching. So the teacher becomes a learner and the learner becomes a teacher. It constitutes the opposite again of the banking model of teaching in which prepackaged knowledge is mechanically deposited into the minds of passive students. You are advancing more and more into the digital world. And without the critical analysis of what is it that we are using to educate the learner, how those prepackaged models coming from the digital online venues are permeating our education. If you are not critical about that, we have to ask ourselves, what education are we providing for whom and what purposes education basically uh, uh, is being, is being used, what do we really want with education? We wanted to domesticate, to prevent thinking. So what is the deal of uh, not having models in which you can encourage more and more thinking instead of just going through tests, and passing tests, standardizing tests and, and regurgitating content? Um, um. <laughs> I was trying to just cut in just to let you know into the last minute or so if that's okay. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap it up then. So conscientization is then a very big concept within that whole idea of uh, Paulo Freire's uh, education, which means the active process in which critical understanding social political circumstances gain to enable and to actively change oppressive circumstances. And then I am going to move on to my last slide. Um, hold on, let me just try to summarize here. Um, the concept of conscientization in raising critical awareness, an active process involving critical understanding of the social, political, economical circumstances to enable actively change oppressive circumstances, not a process of merely to increase awareness, but conscientization always will include the next step, actually transform the circumstance that cause oppression. And therefore, we basically have a quote at the end by Freire say the possibility for serious study that can move gradually to a deeper level, the level of the basic reason of, for things. So why do we have what we have? And that can be applied to health problems and preventive medicine as well. And uh, no one constructs a serious democracy, which implies radically change the societal structures, reorienting the politics of production and development, 
reinventing power, doing justice to everyone, abolishing the unjust and immoral gains of the all-powerful without previously and simultaneously working for these democratic preferences and these ethical demands. Thank you and obrigado. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. That, that's great.